It takes half a day and a solid block of wood to carve just one pair of traditional Dutch clogs, or klompen. Farmers and factory workers across the Netherlands have worn these wooden shoes for over 800 years. Every village has a clock maker, eh? like a, a bakery or a butcher. But today, there are only 10 left in the whole country. In the early 1900s, machines largely replaced hand carvers. And then wearing wooden clogs fell out of style. Today, klompen are mostly sold as souvenirs. That's left clog makers and painters juggling multiple businesses or inventing an entirely new kind of art to stay afloat. Martin Dijkman recreated this Dutch masterpiece with more than 13,000 mini clogs. We visited the Netherlands to see how one of the oldest klompen businesses is still standing. A pair of clogs starts with a fresh block of wood from a willow or poplar tree. It doesn't weigh much when it dries. When you have a hardwood, it's also heavy. So when it's finished, it should, it should be you have a lot of kilos on your, on your foot. Martin makes sure to avoid any knots in the wood, like this new branch forming. So it's not good. Get a hole in, 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 in the shoe afterwards. He then chops out the rough shape of a shoe. Martin is a fourth generation clog maker, and he still uses the axe his father gave him when he was 12. The blade's handle is curved to help protect his hand. When it's straight, it will cut your fingers. But he still has to be careful. If he cuts too much, then he has to start all over again. Has that ever happened to you before? Yep, many times. So you have to practice a lot. Earlier days there were uh, schools it takes you seven years to learn it. Klompen schools don't exist anymore. So Martin learned everything from his father. The Dijkman family has been carving clogs in the town of Lutenberg for over a hundred years. Martin took over the family business in 1997. Today, he lives behind his workshop and he has clogs, well, everywhere. You need three, four pairs in one year. Martin shapes the shoe on a wooden bench his father built over 50 years ago. The long blade on top is called a palmus, and it's also about a half century old. He starts by carving the outside of the clog, peeling off slice after slice. The two pieces have to be even. Oh, this one is too high. This one is a little bit, uh, yeah, this is more pointed. Yeah, to start again, <laughs> yeah. Martin can now begin digging out the inside of the shoe, starting with two holes. All these spoon drills he inherited are more than 80 years old. This one is called a lepel bore and works like an ice cream scoop. He uses this larger lepel bore to carve out the space between the two starter holes. You can see it's very uh, intensive. Slowly, he works his way down to the toe box, removing rosettes of wood with each turn. He checks the length every step of the way with this old school ruler. Martin says shoemakers used to measure clogs with their thumbs. But Napoleon invented the centimeters. And a wooden shoe at that time, in, in, uh, they, they have to go over two centimeters. Today, he's working on a pair for a child. The size must be 20, 20 centimeters. Next up, he carves out the toe box and the arch. This step, he says, takes the longest. When you have a little stone in your shoes, you feel that. So yeah, you have to make it smooth. Lastly, he forms the heel. It's about three and a half centimeters tall. One final measurement, and he can begin smoothing the outside of the shoe. So this is the nicest part. Martin says 65% of the original wood piece is cut away. He burns the scraps to dry out his newly carved clogs. Each master clog maker etches in a design, sort of like a signature. 
This is my grandfather's design. Yeah, I keep this, this alive. It's hard to follow the exact history of wooden clogs because most rotted away or were used as firewood. The oldest wooden shoe found in the Netherlands dates back to the 13th century, and iterations were found across Europe. But their popularity in the Netherlands was the longest lasting. Wood was cheap and easy to find, and it protected workers' feet from sharp objects or from a stomping cow. Clogs were also water resistant, important for a shoe used to trudge across the Netherlands' wet and muddy landscape. By the 16th century, everyone from farmers and fishermen to factory workers were wearing them. But come the early 20th century, leather became more affordable for the working class, and machines started replacing local clog makers. Clogs had a small resurgence during World War II when leather was rationed. But soon after, Klompen got a reputation as a shoe of the poor and fell out of fashion. And as clog making dies, so too does this art form. One of the last clog painters in the country lives about 70 miles away in the picturesque fishing town of Hindelopen. Peter Botsma has been painting clogs for almost four decades. I wasn't uh, a person to study. So when I was 15, I knew already I have to work every day with my hands. He starts with the base coat, either hand painted or sprayed on. It smells a little bit. Uh... Between drying, applying a second coat of paint, and sanding, it takes Peter two days to complete just the base color. It paints easier. That's also for the protection. Then he brushes on local flowers, like daisies and tulips, and a bird. And we call them the lucky bird, the Haruda. He adds shadows in gray or brown and white for highlights. I'm painting now the, the typical uh, Hindeloper flowers. We call that uh, Hilper Schilderwerk. And it's from Scandinavia. It's very old. But we paint like it's in the nature. And in the nature, uh, nothing is perfect. The flowers and the trees. So when you do it too big, too small, that's not a problem. Peter learned everything he knows from his father, who ditched fishing for painting in the 1970s. My father was not uh, good for fishermen, but he was always sick on sea. In 2016, he and his two sisters took over the family business. Nowadays, Peter still makes the designs his dad taught him. And I paint every day the same flower, this one, and again, and again, and again. And my father said, no, that's not good. Again. Wow, again, for two years. It goes better, easier, like dancing. Below his workstation, paint has built up for generations. And when there is uh, finished, or there is too much on the, then we do like this. Because my father painted on this table uh, many, many years. It takes Peter about two hours to paint one pair of clocks that he then sells for 50 euros. I cannot live for 25 uh, euro in one hour for always, because I have three children, I have a wife, she needs a lot of money, my wife. <laughs> so I have to think other things. He says customers wouldn't buy his clogs if they were more expensive. To boost business, he sells small souvenir klompen for just a few euros. These blue ones are actually painted in China and shipped back to the Netherlands. He also paints custom orders like rocking horses and chairs. And he runs a gift shop, a skating museum, and even a restaurant. So you have to uh, try to do uh, five things at once. All around him are reminders of the painters that came before him, a living museum. This is one of the painting pellets of my father. Peter estimates fewer than 10 professional Hindelopen style painters are left in the country. The quality of the, the hand painting uh, style, I think it's gone. Just like Peter, Martin can't make a living just from his handmade wooden clogs. He says hardly anyone wears them anymore. In the countryside where I live, eh, in Luttenberg, uh, people use it as uh, to let the dog out in the evening, uh, do something in the garden. 
so he had to find a way to keep his family's heritage alive. In 2007, he started a new kind of mosaic, replications of famous masterpieces like Vermeer's Milkmaid from thousands of tiny clogs. His night watch by Rembrandt took 30,000 shoes and three years to complete. My father said as a joke, maybe we can make the night watch from Rembrandt. So I said to him, yeah, it's too difficult. But a week later I was thinking, yeah, why not? He started with a pixelated version of the piece and then hand painted each mini shoe, one or two different colors, before gluing it into place. Oil paint, you have to paint two, three times for the best results. So I had some help from volunteers who are living here in the area. For tourists in the Netherlands, wooden clogs make great souvenirs, as much a symbol of the country as tulips, windmills, and cheese. Martin charges over $260 for a handmade pair. At that price point, he sells only five a year. Most of what's on sale in his shop are machine-made ones that go for around $30. You can see this one is a made by hand, and this is polished, sandpapered, by machine, yeah. Which do you prefer? Of course. Why? Handmade it, huh? <laughs> yeah, you can see the, the art in it. The foodie should make, make three pairs in one day. And now we have factories. The quickest one can make 30 pairs in one hour. To keep the business going, he also hosts tour groups with his wife Marika and holds demonstrations of hand carving clogs. With their many hustles, both Peter and Martin have managed to keep their crafts alive. But most clog artisans like them are close to retirement. So the future of their art forms is uncertain. My son is not uh, to take over, so I think I'm the last wooden show maker from my family. That is what it is. Peter could be looking at the same fate. None of his children plan to take on the family business. I'm now 50 years, 52. <laughs> and I think uh, maybe we finished by 65 and then it's over. <laughs> That's the way it goes. Sport shoe, the Nike Air, or oh, high heels. And this one, the Armani. Yeah, this, I think this one is a nice, nice one.